So, uh, maybe I don't know many of you and many of you don't know me. Perhaps I just quickly introduce myself. So, um, I work for the European Commission for the Joint Research Center. And the Joint Research Center is, the, um, so to speak, the scientific arm of, of the Commission. So our, um, our mission is to support policymaking with uh, science and another type of, of knowledge um, um, in order for the Commission to develop policymaking. So uh, I've been working on uh, citizen engagement and but public participation for a long time. And uh, just this month, uh, three weeks ago, we launched a competence center on um, participatory and deliberative democracy. And through um, the work that we have been doing, although it's a lot, you know, to support the, the, the work of the other services of the commission. We also, because we are joint research center, we also do a lot of experimentation. And so I've been always, uh, and yeah, for, for the last 10 years, very uh, interested in, in the aspect, in the um, uh, part public participation from below, so uh, all, all these forms, and I became very interested um, since 2014 on uh, DIY science and all the makers movement and so on and so forth. So, and uh, Stom, no, I'm also like second generation of the post-normal science. So we here uh, with with Frederico who was in my one of my PhD students. Uh, we were looking into uh, this uh, this movement, this realm of, of of makers, of makers, and in particular those that are tinkering and doing things uh, in science. Um, you know, to understand well by by what kinds of of qualities do they um, you know perform the work because they are not scientists they. Um, you, you, you can have different types of, um, they qualify themselves as different things from uh, amateurs, from, uh, you know, people that like to work in their garage uh, or people that go to makerspaces and so on and so forth. But some are actually uh, have professional careers, even in science, but they go to places where they can experiment and do things that other, they cannot do uh, probably in their um, in their institutions. And this is a particular uh, case in DIY biology, for example, where a lot of uh, biologists and uh, and um, synthetic biologists also go to these places to experiment, to do experiments that they probably would not be allowed to do. So um, it's a very scattered uh, movement because uh, you know, there are different people doing very different things and, and operating uh, also the places from where people uh, operate are very different. Uh, so I was just giving a little bit of context of where, why this paper arose and so on. Perfect. So we started looking into um, cases and also we were, we have been studying uh, the, the maker movement um for some for some time we for instance we hold a database of all the makerspaces that are there in the european union uh and i can say that there are more than 1000 of such spaces that go for the name of makerspace fab labs or hacker spaces so there is really uh, different also different denominations for this space so it's very scattered and i think this is important because when you start thinking about you know quality and quality assessment and quality assurance and what does this have to do with uh, you know uh, how do these communities become extended to communities this is very important because there is not an unifying um, there is not uh, you know a single way of 
uh, describing um, the, this movement. But there are, however, some things that are common to what people that are part of these um, yeah, places, uh, spaces do. So what in this paper, what we were uh, looking at, so, um, so we, were think, we were looking at the relationship between uh, these kinds of settings and the personal science and also the quality. We were uh, also questioning whether, you know, these DIY science communities, uh, to what extent are they extended to your communities and how and uh, when. And to do this, we studied, uh, we did some empirical work. We looked at, um, in particular, we focused on very, three very different uh, case studies. Uh, and we, we, also, we also conducted a, a very large number of in-depth interviews. But in this paper, we all actually only used 12 of these interviews. We conducted 60 in-depth interviews uh, with members of these communities. But for the purposes of this paper, we only uh, used, uh, used 12. And then uh, this is also, um, the paper is also informed by a workshop that we organized back in 2015 uh, with Jeremy with Rav Ravitz uh, about DIY science and precisely questioning the parts of quality uh, where we brought in a lot of uh, practitioners and a lot of, of people that are from from different world, from different uh, member states, and so on. And so we uh, investigate meanings of quality, about uh, not, not only about the, their doings, but also about you know their discourse, because um, that's um, uh, we we looked into by looking at the, into the cases. We also we analyze their discourse and also the the interviews. Um, and then um, we, we, the paper reflects on whether, you know, some of the, 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 the ethos, uh, the patterns that we, we found across the, um, the, the, this, this, um, this material, if it could inspire a reflection on what has been called uh, a crisis uh, in, in science. So one of these cases, uh, for example, was this uh, robo hand. Uh, and it's, it's a guy that uh, Richard Van Haas, he uh, lost part of his hand. And so he got interested on, on making, you know, uh, prothesis and cheap prothesis so that everyone could, uh, could access them. Uh, even in countries where, um, you know, there are not a lot of uh, resources and there is the healthcare system doesn't support these things. So he started, um, he started small, but then uh, it gradually uh, enlarged. And this is, this is about robotics and uh, it, it, it implies um, uh, programming and it implies fabricating uh, things and so on. So he used uh, a makerspace type of space to do this kind uh, of work. And it was not only, uh, he was a carpenter, by the way. And this was, so this project starts with, from a need and from an issue that this person uh, really uh, cared about. Then the next uh, is this uh, safe cast. Safe cast was uh, in the aftermath of, uh, of Fukushima. Uh, there were many people that were not trusting the, um, the measurements that the government was doing on radiation, including you know, the places where these radiation measurements were being done. And so um, this, uh, it was initiated by a professor in, in a university, but with 
also in conjunction with a, a makerspace, they realized this uh, this gadger of, of radiations that was very is very cheap, and they started distributing it and uh, measuring where for other people, uh, you know, for people out there was uh, important to measure the radiation. And so they started producing a lot of data and, and, and this was actually a very accurate device. And so here is a case where you are producing counter knowledge and uh, that is actually challenging, you know, the, the official one. So, and it could not have, it was, uh, it was so important that what, I, what came out from this uh, exercise uh, could not be ignored by the authorities. So that's another uh, case of uh, intervention of a, a community um, that uh, or, or, you know people that were had a specific concern and went out there to um, develop uh, means to um, to assess the the, the issue. Uh, so these were two of the examples that we 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 gave in uh, in the paper. Um, there's a third one, but um, uh, I want now to focus a little bit on you know on our the results of our conversations with this with this uh, with the members of this uh, of these uh, makerspaces, and these are uh, four. Uh, you know, very important uh, patterns that we find in all these spaces. So first of all, they are all conceived as collaborative physical spaces. So they are, there is always a place and this place can be, depends on where it is situated. Today, you know, many museums have maker spaces and universities have maker spaces that are even called fab labs. Fab lab is a, is a, a variation of uh, invented in, in MIT is a sort of business model for the thing, but uh, the, the, the people that are more, you know, really close to the ground don't want to uh, connect to Fab Labs, so they, they, they really want to keep this separated, but there is always a physical place where people go freely. Uh, and so there might be some kind of membership because if you use materials, uh, you, you go. You you need to also to, to contribute to the uh, to pay this this material and so on. But there is a physical place, so people meet, and that is the the there is the aim is that you know people encounter themselves, encounter and do things together. And then it is very focused on uh, personal and digital uh, fabrication. So there is machinery in this in this maker space people can prototype things um, and then importantly is the part of network and uh, also importantly is the part of the open source culture so everything that is produced um, is 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 shared so what did we find uh, in terms uh, from our conversations and from discourse analysis of um, the cases we have uh, evaluated. Well, in terms of uh, quality or qualities that are valued uh, within the community. Uh, first is the, the value of failure and the value of negative uh, results in the sense that, uh, um, you know, it's not, um, it's not just about celebration of, of achievements, uh, but th there is celebration also on the, on the failure in the sense that, you know, if, if a certain experiment has failed, there is a lot of discussion and, um, a common uh, will to um, to see how the issue can be resolved. So, and this is uh, they describe this, and you, you from our our own experience with some makerspaces because we work also with makerspaces. This is a very important aspect of culture, of the of the yeah their their culture. So, and there is no so the the, the assessments 
uh, like in science, you know, it's about excellence and indicators of excellence and all that stuff. And there is no indicator of failure, right? So, and so, and and here, they the the way we see it is that they focus more on the feasibility and the reliability of what they are doing, and and because they have a specific uh, when they go to to the makerspace is to solve some kind of of uh, issue. For uh, the I, I have this in another slide, but. Um, the COVID in COVID nine during COVID nineteen times, makerspaces uh, there was a call uh, for makerspaces to invent to you know to recreate or to um, to do masks uh, not masks sorry the um, the apparatus the respiratory apparatus for hospitals because the hospitals didn't have this and there were a lot of makerspaces. Uh, fabricating these things or adapting, you know, devices that were not really meant for these to be used uh, in in hospitals and in clinics to ensure the um, uh, ventilation of, of of patients. So this was a massive uh, call. Um, and, and in that sense, so you the, the the focus, you know, it was not to produce something. Uh, that it need to fit the purpose, and that's they, they go to uh, the, the the people that go to the makerspaces go there to resolve specific problems. And then uh, another thing that uh, came out is that they are not expecting that you have you know what they produce is universal or that needs to be fit everywhere, or uh, but it's rather situated uh, usually. Um, so it's to, to, to resolve or individual or community problems or specific problems where these uh, communities are uh, located. And then another thing is that uh, we find is that, and I, I, there's a, a quote that uh, this would deserve more, more exploration, but we didn't have a lot of this. We asked them, so what do you do with ethics, right? Because if you are fiddling with you know, biological material and things like that, what do you do with this? And so, and the response it was like, well, we, you know, we don't want to constrain people. Uh, so they came here and do experiments, but if there is a problem, then the, 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 the community uh, meets and addresses the problem. So it's not that you can do anything, but still you don't put uh, a priori um, constraints, but if there is a problem, they address it. But I, I not from this work, from our work, but there is work from another uh, colleague, um, Delgado, uh, about DIY science, for example, ethics codes, and um, and if you and there was one for Europe and one for the United States. Maybe now now they are more refined and aligned, but there was and uh, it was really um, you know not a precise uh, thing. So they they don't. Uh, their their way of doing this is okay if there is a problem we address it and so what we we see in the end is that there are multiple and coexisting uh, qualities qualities and also modes to assure them so there is not a single way of addressing um, addressing problems uh, across these uh, communities what we found also, um, and we tried to, to put, put it as um, a possible ethos across uh, DIY science from what they, they were doing. And I think this is the, probably the, the most interesting um, part of the, of the analysis that we conducted. Um, and we tried to, to, yeah, to, to group these into, into different key um, commitments, into commitments that these communities uh, have uh, when they are uh, working. Um, 
so one of the things is agency. So in, in DIY science uh, milieu, um, what we found that, um, that their operation is strongly related to notions of, of freedom and responsibility and, and also um, autonomy. So they are not uh, paid by, by uh, anyone. So they have, um, they have freedom to tinker or to uh, creatively you know, uh, develop uh, prototypes or, or other types of, um, of actions uh, as they please, because it's, um, it's either an individual or um, a small community uh, endeavor. Uh, then uh, I already exemplified this, the care, no? If they actually deal with what the Della Bella Casa uh, referred as matters of care, things that are, you know, people are uh, want to see action about or get even are prepared to take action about. And normally that are things that are neglected um, and um, or um, uh, for instance, I think the example of the carpenter that started to do processes that were uh, much more accessible to, to everywhere, uh, to, to people that didn't have, um, could not afford those is an example of that because yes, there are a lot of processes out there, but there is also uh, uh, an issue here of, of accessibility that is not really being, um, being tackled. So, uh, but there is also uh, neglected knowledge. So um, we, we found that um, they, um, they essentially operate on matters that care to them of, or to the community where they are, uh, they belong to. Then the aspect of time and, and tempo, this is something that they also refer as very unique to them. They, it's, they have, the, the, you know, it's, it's Largo and it's the, they use the time as, as they want, because again, there is not uh, pressure or, or commitment. Um, if, if it is urgent, well, they treat it with urgency, but if it is not urgent, uh, they also have the time to curate what they are uh, proposing or doing. Um, and integrity in, again, this is in the sense that there is no external pressure from an individual or organization. So they don't have to respond to clients. They don't have to, um, and I mean, and they have no reason to falsify uh, their results or to, to you know, to, 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 to produce things that are, um, that are false because uh, you know, part of the culture is also about uh, failure and, and experimenting and tinkering and understanding um, if you, how things work and how can they improve them and so on and so forth. So, and then the key thing is, is also openness. I mean, everything that is produced within these communities is shared. So, um, and it's not about just you, you have access to the resources or the machinery and so on and so forth. It's also about everything is documented so that others can repeat, others can redo. Um, this is a legacy from, from open source code uh, where um, you, can, you can take uh, open source code and uh, re, you know, add things, expand, uh, correct, uh, and so on. And this is um, still something. Yeah, so basically, uh, I think uh, to conclude um, just this short account of what we did in the paper, what we find is, you know, this, this quality is in the making all the time. So this quality assurance is, uh, and quality assessments are, are in the making. And it's always 
very dependent on um, on the, the the project itself, the community, but also the project. So the quality is not the same depending on what you are working on. And um, I think there is a big uh, focus on fit for purpose projects and a big focus for, for this community to um, provide extended facts, uh, to provide, you know, so, uh, sometimes counter knowledge, but other times just, you know, more knowledge about uh, the things uh, that uh, interest science uh, in general. So, yeah, I'm open to um, questions. Can, yeah. I, can, can yes. I ask a question? Yeah, um, I found that very interesting, of course, from the perspective of an academic scientist that uh, communicates especially with chemists. And I was wondering, uh, did you also find out anything about the possible touching points and possible acceptance of DIY science in the established communities like academic science and research or on the other side, let's say corporate research and development and innovation? Um, my, my first intuition would be that especially academic scientists would not take DIY science too serious because they believe they, they are the competent people and DIY science is, it can possibly result in some innovation, but is that really science? Like, and on the other side, are there institutional obstacles for DIY science? Was there any DIY scientist who had a chance to publish something in the journal Or would that, would that be a problem because there is no institution behind it, for example? What about patents? Does DIY science result in patents often? Did you find anything out about this too? You asked too many questions and okay. not too many. You asked many questions and I didn't have a pen. <laughs> Sorry. So no, I found the pen. Okay. Now I'm going to, uh, to answer some of these. And then if I forget some, you, you ask me, you please ask me again. Um, so, well, there are many ways and I want to answer this first. Um, it depends where you are, you know, on, on, because DIY science is very vast also as fields. You know, you have your DIY biology and there is a lot about that already. In, in fact, as I, as I, as I mentioned, Uh, many people in DIY biology are actually academics that go to these places to uh, do things that probably in their laboratories they cannot do. So there is this uh, yeah, um, dual, um, dualism, let's say. Um, and then Uh, and then, but you have also these in the field of electronics. There are a lot of people that are also in mainstream and go to these places to feed, to fiddle because they have the equip different equipment uh, because of the open source aspect, you know, that they have better access to uh, because they are better connected. So that one of the most important things in these kinds of um, spaces is the part of of networking and it's networking with people that are tinkering, you know, experimenting and doing things out of the box that, uh, you know, that are not paid <laughs> by, by fundings. And, uh, you know, because the, the, uh, the universities survive on funding, I suppose, no, you don't, you do a research, you need funding and some things are not funded. So these spaces also allow you to experiment with things that are, you know, are not considered fundable. <laughs> so uh, somehow, no? Uh, now, so this is one aspect. The second aspect is uh, about the fact that today many universities uh, have maker spaces. So, and so actually, you know, the, 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 the staff, the academic staff actually also goes to the makerspaces and do things. So it's becoming a little bit hybridized in some cases, right? Um, for instance, I can give you the example of the University of Barcelona, uh, the, the architecture faculty as a big fab lab 
and it's one of the biggest fab labs in Europe and they prototype all kinds of uh, architectural uh, staff there and it's very well connected with the department and the, 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 the faculty. So the one thing feeds uh, um, the other. And uh, the, the important thing is that you can have people that comes to the fab lab that has nothing to do with university. And that is the interesting part because you have these interactions with people that are not the professionals, but are interested in the thing, right? So that's, that's so, and then um, there are maker spaces that actually are very well connected with the innovation world. They are doing things, prototyping things to then, you know, spin off um, little companies or big companies. I can give you an example of an Italian, um, an Italian makerspace here in Milan. They were doing prothesis for kids uh, that had this, uh, you know, I don't know how to call this, well, little handicaps that they cannot write properly and, or, you know, things like that. And they prototyped a lot of stuff, and then they become they became a little company uh, that you know a startup that started to do to do things. So they are also hubs for startups uh, many times. So it depends really in the area where these uh, maker spaces are are operating. Others, for example, I'm thinking about another one in uh, in the US that is about open ecology and it's about ag agriculture. So they go there and experiment <laughs> with alternative ways of doing agriculture, and then they they actually then uh, you know they do trainings to farmers and things like that. So they 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 spin off the, the their experiments in the in the makerspace. So it's um, I don't know if I failed any question from you, but. Uh, uh, one one question I'd like to uh, ask again. Then, uh, what about um, the communication with other scientific communities? My example was, for example, uh, let's say a DIY scientist believes there is uh, there are good results on some experiment, let's say, or testing a new device. They want to publish it, but the publisher says as long as there is no institution behind it, like a university and an official lab, we cannot publish this. Like, did you experience? Or did you talk to people who said, who complained actually that uh, they cannot communicate because there are these institutionalized expectations, so to say, on how to do the science? So, um, first of all, many of these makerspaces have their own publication uh, channels. So they don't want to publish in journals, basically. Okay. I mean, you know, it's, it's, they have their own thing. They, 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 there, were, there, is a, there, is a, there are magazines uh, from makers, but uh, many of these uh, places have websites that they maintain and they put out their things there. Um, so I don't, I, th I think I even remember one of the interviews saying, I mean, we don't have any kind of desire of putting our th things behind paywalls and, you know, where everybody, we, we are reaching out. So they have their community, they reach out their own uh, community. And I think it's rather the, way, the other way around that scientists chip in and try to see what the, the others are doing, of course. I'm simplifying this, but there is communication. You, you think about Barcelona, of course they talk. Now it's the, 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 the faculty members talk with the people that go to the makerspace because they are very close. They are, they are interlinked. But I don't think there is this uh, desire of, having said that, I'm thinking about a university in Amsterdam, uh, not in Amsterdam, so in Holland, uh, I can't quite remember now the name, but it was, um, basically it was, a, they, they didn't hack in the end because it was given to them, as, but it was a, a space and they created a, a, a university that was um, between artists and, and, and makers but it tried to follow the same kind of, of uh, you know, spirit, but in, it, was, it was different. They, um, 
and uh, th but they still they didn't publish uh, I mean it's not their desire it's more the people that go and study them that then do <laughs> all right thanks thanks so much I noted uh, Nic Nicola first and then Tom yeah hello Angela um, I was just wondering uh, how uh, do it yourself activities you now fit uh, uh, theoretically you know, in the post normal science framework I'm in mind uh, this paper you now from uh, from Tovit, uh, and Ravitz, uh, the seminal paper distinguishing between uh, applied science uh, professional consultancy and post normal uh, science you no know? and this distinction made the based on this two dimensional graph where you had the uncertainty on the one axis and the decision stake uh, on the other and post normal science uh, should be in the area where you have uh, uh, high decision sta uh, stakes uh, and uh, or uh, high uncertainty and so uh, where would you locate uh, uh, do you uh, do it uh, yourself activity you know when we were doing this paper uh I had the temptation of uh, hacking that graph and and adding uh, another another layer to it. I really had that temptation, but then um, I thought, well, and I think this is the the message also of the paper is that I think these are extended peer communities. So, um, and, and I think the, the, the work that, the, 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 that I, I was referring to on, on SafeCast, um, it's, it's really about that, you know? They provide counter knowledge. They are challenging mainstream, you know, um, yeah, mainstream knowledge production systems. They were, you know, criticizing the way radioactivity was measured, and but they were also providing the means uh, to the you know, to extend these measurements to other people and to let other people frame, you know, what were the places uh, where these measurements should be should be done, right? Because it was the the places where people mat where for people mattered uh, uh, that mattered to people, right? So we decided uh, to not change the the graph. We actually don't use the graph, but we place these the IOI scientists as uh, extended peer community. I see. So it is a, maybe that uh, post-normal science needs uh, an additional dimension, you mean? Yes, we, we, we I, don't, I don't, I frankly don't think so. Because, you know, if we continue to think that the extended peer community are still professional, then we have a problem. But if we start to think that, you know, the extended peer community are knowledge holders and people that, you know, can produce knowledge that addre it's addresses the problem because that graph is about problem solving strategies, then I think these communities are still problem solver solving um, solvers, let's say, like this. So, and they are not professional consultants and they are not, uh, the, the, you know, the professional scientists, but they are on the extended peer community. Okay, uh, I will then uh, ask a question. And that has to do with, uh, with uh, the ethos that you are, that you are proposing for do-it-yourself science. And uh, when uh, Nicolas uh, was doing the paper on trust and the ethos of, uh, of uh, post-normal science, uh, 
then uh, uh, the ethos there had kind of two functions. And one function was that it kind of could be a guideline for new practitioners uh, enrolling into, uh, in this case with action, uh, uh, enrolling into the do-it-yourself science activity, kind of and an, uh, an, uh, uh, helping tool to kind of grasp what was going on there. Uh, but also the second part of this uh, of an ESOS is, is to be kind of a, like something that will uh, promote reflections, uh, also critical self-reflections. Uh, um, so I was just wondering uh, 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 your comment on this on this being an ethos. I mean, do they kind of uh, do they themselves? I mean, it, it's your it's your construct, but do they kind of uh, could it kind of serve to to help uh, new new people? Let's say, for example, uh, I'm sure our students would love to uh, participate in the uh, in these do it yourself uh, these uh, these uh, spaces uh, maker spaces. Uh, but uh, then, uh, okay, not to be totally off target when they were entering into these spaces. So could could this ethos then be help them to to kind of grasp the idea? Uh, that's kind of one element. And secondly, are they the the experienced people there? Are they reflecting on uh, on these uh, these uh, norms and values uh, making up the 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 ethos? So has this ESOS traveled from you, your research and uh, your co-authors research into uh, the maker spaces? This is something that is uh, maybe not exactly in these words, but is it then, uh, do they believe in this, uh, uh, this, this ESOS and does it help them reflect critically on what they are doing? Well, um uh, i think we we had no we didn't uh, i mean we sh we showed shared it with a uh, few people that we know that we worked with and um i mean they they liked it so but, but this was after the paper was published uh we 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 talked with actually three yeah, three Two people, one from um, yeah, one from Amsterdam, and so on. And they actually liked it. They said they 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 resonated with it. But um, I don't think we have done the work of making it travel properly yet. You know, uh, we but we base this on what these people were saying when we addressed them. Uh, so we made all these interviews and we made a conclusion, but I think this work of making it travel, we have not done uh, yet. Um, but I think our, our, um, our purpose was not so much to tell the DIY community, you know, by which ethos they should or could operate, but um, it was more like, look, there are different ways of doing science. And, uh, and so maybe you can get inspired by people that actually do things and, um, and think about things, thinker and think about things. And you could perhaps as a scientist be inspired by these kinds of values. Uh, and so, Maybe we are too naive or ambitious, but that was more the thing, not to tell the DIY scientist how to become a DIY scientist. Um, that's, that was not, uh, although I think when you enter in a, in a makerspace, um, the, there are things here in these ethos that it's uh, it's like you know on your face to learn immediately otherwise you are not should not be there you know like the part on sharing it's just it's like mandatory right 
and uh, the part of there is no here there is no obligation to succeed you can fail and so the value of failure and the value of negative as ways of learning is is another thing that you 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 get immediately and the other things i mean is that you know there are no time pressures so it's a very simple thing but should make you reflect on the processes that are leaving uh, science uh, and scientists to some kind of you know places where probably they don't want to be you know um, all these clients thing this uh, sometimes you know having to um, when uh, subscribe to narratives that perhaps they are critic about but uh, because they need the funding they will do the same right these kinds of uh, commitments um, and so yeah to to help with uh because the, the the what is i don't know saltelli and many others and funtovitz and, and and many others thought wrote about this crisis in science right and many of these things uh in our reflection could be helped with uh with um with reflecting on the current scientific actors so our contribution is to, okay, can these values inspire, uh, you know, that we somehow transform science as well. Science that is pursued in, uh, in mainstream institutions. We don't know. Can I ask a couple of, um, so can I ask um, two different questions? Um, the first one was at the very beginning, uh, Angela, you said that the EU is setting up participatory uh, or participatory democracy center or something. What, why, you know, 50 years after SDS has been making noises about public engagement in science, why, why now? So what, what's been the trigger for that? Perhaps you know, I don't know. Uh, and the other one is a trivial question, but what are the synthetic biologists doing? And <laughs> I'm intrigued because I know they, is it legal? <laughs> I'm just interested. Thank you. So yeah, the, the competence center was launched uh, actually on the 6th of October, so it exists. Um, so it was a process of uh, almost uh, yeah more than 20 years until we got there and there are there is um, first there is a lot of uh, political momentum for this um, and this was triggered by um, you know recent um, events in politics uh, Right, so the rises of uh, populism, the, the Trumps, uh, Brexit, uh, all this stuff, right? And yeah. uh, someone asked, well, you know, we have to talk to the people. Mm. <laughs> and so, um, and then um, I, there is a lot of local experiments on engaging the public loads of them and many in deliberative ways so uh, the oecd published last year a report on uh, that they called deliberative wave and there is like more than 300 of these kinds of um, activities uh, around the world that they have qualified and um and so you know um after uh, many years of, uh, there was responsible research and innovation. Before that, there was science in uh, in society, science and and with and so on and so forth. And you know, you 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 hammer so many hammer so many years that at a certain point the door needs to open, no? Mm. And so the center is the the result of uh, 
of yeah more than 20 years of uh, of effort of bringing citizens not only uh, uh, yeah both on the design of policies but also bringing them uh, in science so uh, i am behind all these uh, these kinds of uh, work in the commission so and it's it's very it's very difficult Does uh, it... there is a new generation that is trying understanding a little better but it's um, i think people also come you know there is a work to do in universities <laughs> i'm afraid to say i mean because people still come with formats and formatted in ways um yeah of not understanding that you know knowledge is distributed so you need to um the way i see and i i mean i'm working in paranormal science for many years i worked with civil Fundovic uh, for for many years and for us i mean it it's about you know considering people as knowledge holders because we all <laughs> are knowledge holders. So and this is very difficult for these people to understand. Mm. Very difficult. Does it institutionalize engagement somehow? Or I mean, or how does it do this? Well, you you start to have a sort of um i don't know i was in a meeting yesterday i just took to a very recent thing and we were it's a project about um how the access to nature and, and environment um influences mental health and it was all triggered by this covid 19 thing and so on so they want to put data and we were in as the part of citizen engagement <laughs> and it's you, you know, you have to go to these meetings and you say, look, we are not here for decoration. Your research questions will have to be framed with our work with citizens. You are not going to, you know, start working on uh, your research questions without having <laughs> what we will bring as matters of concern uh, from the side of citizens and also perhaps ideas on how to address these things. And this is a constant, a constant reminder and institutionalization uh, gives you the authorization and the authority to come to these meetings and say you are going to work differently, because that's the aim is to work differently, you see, mm -hmm. and, um, and it's the same for policymaking. Uh, and I think we have very good allies actually in the Commission at the moment. Uh, the Director General of RNI, his paquet is really all <laughs> for citizen engagement. So I think we are, if nothing happens, we are evolving somewhere. We don't know where. Of course, you know, as everything in these kinds of institutions, we the thing that we have to to, to do is to uh, avoid that people uh, banalize these kinds of uh, work, mm -hmm. right? It's to, to say, no, you are not going to window dress. <laughs> it's different from what you have been doing. So it's a different way of working. From DIY biology, what I can, uh, I can send you some, some links. I don't have them here, but I can send you some links. Of on genetics on yeah <laughs> people hacking biohacking themselves injecting things changing genes um uh, it's uh, it's a world <laughs> <laughs> thanks all right so i guess coming to the end of the session